Now going into this, I know a lot of you that are returning viewers are already aware that I've made an MCU Spider-Man 4 at least a couple times by now. However, due to some complications, those older versions are no longer on the channel. So to make up for that fact, I thought today I would go over my improved version of this plot. Obviously, I've given my two cents on the story quite a few times, but today I've gathered a lot of my ideas from the previous versions and improved upon it for this video. But if Spider-Man fan fictions and Spider-Man related content is what you guys are looking for, make sure to like, share and subscribe to not miss out on all the latest. And without further ado, thank you for clicking and let's get on with the video. So for this movie, we need to focus on what made the ending of the previous so special, leaving Peter with nothing and no one, all on his own as he prepares to tackle his Spider-Man and Peter Parker's lives head on, now fully immersing in the lessons he has learned from the previous movie. This movie is to take place at least a year and a half since the ending of No Way Home, allowing room for growth and a breather between stories. We open this movie, however, in the past. The year is 2015, and we watch as the thunder crackles and the rain pours down to the dark, gritty streets of New York's underground. We watch as Mac Gargan is on the run, being chased down by notorious mercenary Abner Jenkins. Gargan was down to one bullet. After a tussle in the rain, Gargan is able to pull out his gun fast enough to shoot a bullet right through Abner's cheek. As the blood splurged out onto Gargan's hand, he left no hesitation as he dived on top of Abner and beat away at the little life he had left within him. The cuts and bruises on his hand laid bare as he struggled to stand, shadowing over Abner's body, the scorpion tattoo visibly striking on his neck as he began walking. Back in the present, we follow a day in the life of Peter. Now attending Empire State University, Peter led a lonely life. After everything that happened, he saw himself wanting to abandon his life as Peter altogether and instead only be Spider-Man. After realizing the amount of pain, hurt and struggle he put his loved ones through, Peter was still living each and every day under the influence that he was never allowed to be happy for the betterment of others. And in doing so, he's almost relapsed in a way. Being constantly late for class, the same habits have caught back up with him. Although a disappointment, Peter had found himself to be a favourite of his teachers, and is a nice voice of reasoning for him. He asked Peter the question that he will spend the movie trying to answer. Is the life he's leading what he wants, or what he needs? Offering this idea of want first need, and what it means to be in the middle of the two terms. The setting of this movie would be a dark autumn, giving us an atmosphere that represents Peter's feelings. Bogged down with a darker colour palette, we were able to reason with the way Peter was feeling. He took the subway home as he made it to his crusty, mouldy apartment. He was greeted with half a dozen eviction notices scattered across the ground, showing us how Peter was not only emotionally struggling, but also physically. He saw the past due bills and back to the emptiness of his wallet as he grabbed his computer. We saw his suit laid across the floor, showing us how untidy Peter was keeping himself. Peter looked back at the screen. He saw a job position of a freelance photographer for the Daily Bugle. He contemplated with the idea, especially after all Jameson did to try and shut Spider-Man down in the previous movie. But out of all the jobs, it offered the most pay. Peter was about to apply when his computer died. He tried plugging it on charge as he came to realize the electricity had been cut. Peter just sat there, holding his head in his hands. The wind breezed through the curtains later that night as Peter found himself late awake on his bed, scrolling through photos of MJ, her reflection glaring back in the softness of his pupils as we saw a gentle tear. It rolled down his cheeks and onto the pillow. Having to lose the woman he loved was the most heartbreaking part of all of this. We saw a flashback filled with a chromatic black and white filter as we saw Peter and MJ on a date. They held each other's hands as they entered a cinema Escaping the snow-filled streets as the two sat in their seats, MJ would lean her head on Peter's shoulder as he became uninterested in the film, as he closed his eyes, immersing in this moment, as in the present Peter show up in the cold, empty and dark apartment all alone. A cold shiver running down his spine as he stared at the lens of his mask glaring back at him. His heart was racing fast as we heard the hard patter of the rain against his window. 
Across the city night, we saw Lot rotting away in Riker's was Gargan. He had spent every second of his time in that cell building up his rage, his hatred for Spider-Man, promising that once he got out, Spider-Man would pay. Later that night, Gargan saw his chance, his opportunity. With a homemade weapon sharpened from an old spoon, he stabbed the guard in front of his cell, took his gun and made a run for it. He shot down all the guards in his path as he was able to override the security lock. Gargan escaped with ease as we saw the look of terror on the warden's face. He issued a citywide manhunt for Gargan, recognizing how dangerous he truly was. We were cut back to ESU as Peter was in the hall hearing a lecture. Distracted and unmotivated, Peter started doodling on his desk. The speaker then talked about how unimportant things, about law and how important it is to understand it, and here today to talk everything about the law was Hell's Kitchen's very own, Matthew Murdoch. Peter's attention was caught as we saw Murdoch walk in the front of the class. Matt talked endlessly about the importance of law and justice, and how sometimes the system meant to protect us can fail us, and it's up to us to make sure the bad stays locked away and the good gets their justice. The talk resonated with Peter. He took a second to process it as we saw him try to grab Matt's attention after the talk. He said he was on his way out to make it quick as Peter asked one question about his speech. We saw an immediate bond be struck between the two as they bantered effortlessly. But as Matt got a phone call about something, Peter's crime system did too. Murdoch said he had to be going, as Peter said the same. Peter ran down the corridor and into the bathroom as he snuck out the window, suiting up on the go. Out in the streets of Manhattan, we saw chaos unfolding as a new supervillain under the name Strikeback was tearing up the banks of the city. We saw how this villain, also known as Anthony Davis, had used a weaponized suit with ring-shaped weapons and how he was destroying the streets. That's when Spider-Man arrived, stopping one of the Stripe Pack's attacks. Making a quip about the hilarious nature of his costume and powers, as Strike Back tried to prove he wasn't a force to be reckoned with. Peter was quickly swiped off his feet as we saw the two tussle. Hits were sent back and forth as Peter tried to hold his ground. He was able to web up one of Anthony's arms as he tried to gain the opposition. However, as Peter looked off to the side, he completely lost concentration as we saw deep in the crowds of people, it was Gargan. Peter knew the face was familiar, he just couldn't pinpoint where. However, Gargan vanished as Strikeback used Peter's distraction to his advantage. Peter was kicked to the ground as he got his arm free. We saw him slowly approaching Peter, laughing hysterically about to finish the job when his attack was floundered by a streamlined red baton. Peter reopened his eyes and looked up as we saw, fully suited up, was the Daredevil. He told Peter he was here to help. Peter asked who the hell this guy was. Murdoch said he was just some random guy he's been tracking down for a while now. That doesn't matter. He needs Spider-Man to flank him and destroy his harness. It's the source of his power. We watched as the two partnered up to stop this threat. Matt's plan was actually successful as Peter ripped out Strikeback's power source, sending him crashing to the ground. Peter webbed him to the floor and placed down his courtesy card tap him back into this idea that he is our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Peter stood side by side with Daredevil as we saw an epic shot of the pair. Matt heard the sirens in the distance as he told Peter they should leave the cops to do their jobs. We were cut to a rooftop in the city. Both Spider-Man and Daredevil were sat on the ledge as Matt explained who that was. He was a criminal that was directly involved in the robbery of one of his clients. Peter said Matt sounded familiar, like he's seen him before. Matt just smiled. He turned to Peter and told him he could feel he was distracted. Peter just said that sometimes this path feels too much for him to bear. Matt gave Peter a great speech about the meaning of sacrifice, this idea of responsibility and choice. Before he left, he handed Peter a card with his law firm number on the back, just in case he got into legal trouble. As Peter looked down, he saw the names Nelson and Murdoch. As Peter put together the fact that Daredevil was Matthew. But before he could say anything, Matt was gone, leaving behind a great message for Peter. Back at his apartment, Peter was still thinking about what Matt had said, and how it was beginning to affect his viewpoint on his approach. Peter received a knock at the door a couple seconds later. He pulled open the almost collapsing door as we saw the landlord, Mr. Muggins, demanding rent from Peter. He said he didn't have it yet, but he's looking for a job and promises to pay it back as soon as possible. Mr. Muggins was pissed, and told Peter this was his last chance. If he didn't pay by Friday, his ass is out of here. Peter understood and said sorry as he closed the door. In the meantime, we watched as Gargan scounded across the city. 
moving with the wind as they got used to being on the outside. The freedom was intoxicating. It fueled his anger even more. When he looked in Spider-Man's eyes, it only made him thirst for his blood even more. Gargan saw his old hideouts had been raided and abandoned as he broke in through the boarded up window. The dust filled the air as Gargan looked around in the dark. All his loadouts were nothing but empty boxes. Gargan got frustrated, realizing he'd have to start all over from scratch, but swore to God he'd make Spider-Man pay. As the thunder crackled, Peter was sat at the foot of his bed, staring at the floor as he reminisced once again about the past, about Aunt May, MJ. Peter was overwhelmed. He looked at the clock. 10.32 p.m. Peter swung across the night city, arriving at the set of apartments. Peter stuck to the outside wall as he looked down. We saw MJ. She was walking alone. Peter smiled. All sorts of emotions ran through his mind when, all of a sudden, MJ was greeted by another man. He wrapped his arm around her and kissed her. As the two locked hands, Peter's heart left his body. On one hand, he was happy for her. He was. But the other tore him apart from the inside out, looking at the life he could have had with the woman he always wanted. As we saw Peter's eyes water, he heard sirens in the distance. He would swing off. As he did, MJ looked up to the empty wall, at first with a glance of confusion, before she continued with her new life. We got to Peter. He was swinging, but he was angry, upset. We felt the rage in his swinging. He never asked to be Spider-Man, to get these powers. He's done his job. He saved the world, he saved the multiverse. Maybe it was time to bring this to an end. He started packing up his suit, ready to get rid of it, when he looked over at a framed picture of him and Aunt May. It was only then he remembered what Spider-Man stood for and the importance he had over the people of the city. Without Spider-Man, who was there to look out for the little guy? Peter threw the suit on the floor as he walked toward the camera. As the morning dawned, we panned up a giant building with a massive sign on the top reading the Daily Bugle. Down at the bottom, looking up at the building, we saw Peter, trying his best to look somewhat presentable as we saw him walk inside. We saw all the workings of the Bugle from the inside, reporters like Robbie Robertson. Peter then turned to the girl at reception as he almost was starstruck. Betty Brandt? She was confused. How do you know my name? Oh, I, uh, I saw your name on the Bugle website. Betty was a little weirded out, but thought Peter to be rather dorky and funny. He said he had an appointment to see J. Jonah Jameson, as he said he was just in a meeting. Seconds later, we saw his Jameson shove someone out of his office, shouting and bawling about how the employee was fired. Betty wished him good luck as Peter walked into the office. Who the hell are you? I'm Peter Parker. I'm here about the freelance job. Jameson went into a frenzy about how the newspaper industry went bankrupt, but how important it was to spread the truth about the menacing acts of Spider-Man. Peter was almost yawning from this speech, but the money prevented him from doing so. He handed Jameson a bunch of shots of Spider-Man in action. Jameson shared his rather brutal opinion on the character, as Peter stood there and took all the insults, as he asked if he got the job. Jameson scoffed, being very, very annoyed about this and about giving money out, but he knew he needed Peter Parker. He grunted in an acceptance as Peter smiled, thanking Jameson as he told him to get him more pictures. On Peter's way out, Betty would throw a thumbs up at him as Peter smiled. For the first time, Peter had a genuine smile on his face as we saw him walk out the bugle. Now that the groundwork's been laid, it's time to dive deep into this story. Peter had been faced with so many questions during the start of this movie, and it's now about answering those questions and figuring out what is right and what he's supposed to do. A huge chunk of this act goes to the development of Gargan as character. Since he's been gone, he's particularly been forgotten by everyone, but the haunting nature of his killings haven't, and he's used that fear to slowly climb his way up the ranks as we start to see his plan unfold. He's been leaving trails of bodies around the city which Peter has been following leading a wild goose chase across Manhattan. Peter was able to put together from the news that this Matt Gargan guy was someone he had stopped a long time ago, and Peter was able to come full circle and realize that his actions have led to severe consequences. After all, Gargan is only on this rampage because of Spider-Man. All these deaths are now on Peter's hands. 
Peterborough tried to get Jameson to make headway within the story and bring Gargan's crimes to justice, but Jameson tells Peter to stick it and that the bugle can't get into any more legal trouble. So Peter was all on his own. No Daredevil, as he'd gone back to Hell's Kitchen. No Avengers. No loved ones. This was a Spider-Man with nothing to lose. As we caught up with Gargan, however, we started to break down his plans. The killings he had made were people directly involved with transporting highly sensitive technology. Gargan's been murdering the people sent to protect it, as he's been stealing from these trucks and taking this equipment for himself. And he's been slowly building something deadly. Peter has had no luck in regards to tracking Gargan and is starting to feel worn out. Peter needed a distraction, something to break up this cycle. He grabbed his jacket as we cut to a graveyard. Peter loomed over his Aunt May's grave as he stared at the name, feeling nothing but guilt. He opened up his heart, saying he didn't know how he can overcome this, this feeling of self-doubt, that he isn't good enough. He then got a call from Betty, who sounded horrified. She told Peter to check the news as Peter looked on his phone, seeing that a containment team of over 30 men was slaughtered by alleged prison escapee, Matt Gargan. We saw the look of sickness in Peter's eyes. He said this had gone far enough. Gargan had gotten what he wanted. He wanted Peter to feel that rage and that sickening stomach feeling that Gargan had spent the last decade feeling. Peter forgot about college, rent, everything that wasn't to do with Gargan as he focused solely on this. Gargan, however, was putting together the last pieces of his build. He just had one last little chore. Gargan armed up with a dangerously sharp knife and a pistol as we pan close into the scorpion tattoo. Closing out act two, we would see the transportation of a toxic bioweapon crafted by a fallen military contractor for the US government. The vault was locked and secured sites with plenty of protection as they were all suspicious of the fact Gargan was attacking them. But here we showcased that Gargan was more than a ruthless killer with a vendetta. Here we showcased his talents, his smartness, as we saw a giant, elaborate trap, Gargan a blade which exploded the convoy. Gargan approached, stabbing and shooting the surviving guards in the path as he blew open the vault. We saw the bioweapon inside, codenamed Subject 14. As Gargan stripped it from its safety net, he threw it into his rucksack as we saw Spider-Man arrive. Introducing their first real showdown of the movie, it was a brutal fight. Even without powers or abilities, Gargan proved his worthiness of being a dangerous threat to Spider-Man. Peter was mentally drained due to his emotions and questions his brain was putting him through, which caused him to lose. Gargan beat Peter till he could barely breathe. Blood splattered across the pavement as we saw Peter wheeze, unable to move. Gargan leaned in close and told him he had no idea how long he'd waited for this. Gargan peeled off Peter's mask as we saw a bloody, broken Peter Parker underneath. Peter told him to finish it. Gargan said this was only the beginning, and now that he knows who he is, He'll make sure those around him suffer too. Peter started laughing as the blood trickled down his nose. Good luck with that. It's just me. Gargan angrily gripped Peter by the throat and said, Fine. Instead, I'll peel your skin off your bones and hang your head on the walls as a trophy. Peter tried defending himself, but he was overpowered. Soon enough, the citizens of New York and dozens of SWAT and police cars surrounded. Protect him, Peter. Gargan knew he was outnumbered. He grunted as he escaped. Peter just laid there. He managed to get his mask back on in time as the police captain, Jean DeWolf, approached him. She saw he was injured. Peter got to his feet, holding his broken bones as he told her he was going to be okay. Gargan got away with whatever was in the truck. We need to find him and stop him right away. Peter would actually befriend the captain, laying early groundwork for their possible partnership in the future. Peter wasn't going to lose the next fight. He was coming for Gargan. So we reach the final act, the collision of everything that has come before, as we start to piece together the ending of this movie and the fourth chapter in Peter's journey as Spider-Man. Peter has been working with both Betty and Jean to try and find Gargan's location. Peter knows he's after him, which rules out any more attacks. If he strikes next, it's going to be personal, and Peter knew exactly what to do. He will grab his suit, stitching up the patches as he pulled down his mask swinging through the dark, desolate streets of New York, ready to fight. Peter chose somewhere out of reach, somewhere he knew nobody would get hurt. Peter arrived at the docks. 
as he used his pull with Betty to get the word out. As Peter told Gargan it was time to end all of this. We saw Gargan watching this on the news. As we heard drills and power tools, we panned up the body of a mechanized, green, overpowered exoskeleton suit. As the computer showcased the bioweapon become injected into Gargan's veins, he screamed out in agonizing pain and torture as we saw a close-up of his glowing green eyes. And this is what brought us to our final battle, the Spider-Man vs. the Scorpion. Now after the entire movie setting it up, Gargan was finally ready to become the ruthless Scorpion as we were drawn to the ultimate showdown, the brutality. Peter's feeling of guilt towards all the innocents left dead because of his actions, and Scorpion's slow descent into madness, only solidified with the serum. Peter used his rage to beat Scorpion down to keep fighting. Suddenly, Peter was stabbed, injected by Gargan's poisonous tail as Peter began seeing delusions. Similar to those Mysterio ones, his mind created nightmares his body thought were real, really honing in in this psychological threat that was the Scorpion. But Peter used those nightmarish visions to create something positive. As he reopened his eyes, there was Aunt May. MJ, Happy, Ned, everyone Peter loved, watching as they cheered Peter on, gave him the courage he needed to keep fighting. Peter broke free from this transfiction as he struck Gargan across the face. He ripped off his mechanized tail and beat away over and over again, knowing he wasn't alone, that his friends, family, will always be with him in spirit. Peter was able to beat Gargan, defeating his past mistakes, and overcoming his fears, his deception, as Peter learned his lesson. A few weeks later, Peter watched as Gargan was properly prosecuted and sentenced to a maximum security cell in the raft, and we saw as Peter was finally able to become truly Spider-Man. Defeating all the obstacles in his path, we saw him pay his rent on time, continue to do his job for the bugle, and Peter was able to accept and move on from MJ fully. Now knowing his choices have led her to be happy in her new journey, Peter would even contemplate asking Betty out, really bringing this comic accuracy to the forefront. We ended with a heroic final swing. Peter soared through the high skyline of New York, the beautiful theme blasting loud and proud as we faded to black and the movie would end. So that is my pitch for a Marvel Spider-Man 4 inside the MCU. I feel having Gargan not become Scorpion till the very end emphasizes his pure evilness and his ever-growing hate towards Spider-Man, and the idea that Peter throughout the movie is struggling with relapsing and how with his courage and strength he can overcome his demons. Of course, make sure to leave your thoughts on this down in the comments. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.